From the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, connecting with thought leaders all around the world, this is a Cube Conversation. Hi, everybody. Welcome to this special Cube digital event where we're focusing in on data ops, data ops in action with generous support from our friends at IBM. Let me set up the situation here. There's a real problem going on in the industry and that's that people are not getting the most out of their data. Data is plentiful, but insights perhaps aren't. What's the reason for that? Well, it's really a pretty complicated situation for a lot of organizations. There's data silos, uh, there's challenges with skill sets and lack of skills. Uh, there's tons of tools out there, sort of a, a tools creep. The data pipeline is not automated. The business lines oftentimes don't feel as though they own the data, so that creates some real concerns around data quality and a lot of finger pointing around data quality. The opportunity here is to really operationalize the data pipeline and infuse AI into that equation and really attack the cost cutting and revenue generation opportunities that are there in front of you. Think about this. Virtually every application this decade is going to be infused with AI. If it's not, it's not going to be competitive. And so we have organized a panel of great practitioners to really dig in to these issues. Uh, first, I want to introduce Victoria Stasiewicz, who's an industry expert in data ops uh, at Northwestern Mutual. Victoria, great to see you again. Thanks for coming on. Excellent, nice to see you as well. And Caitlin Halfrey is the director of AI, of the AI Accelerator and client success at IBM and also part of the chief data officers uh, organization at IBM who has actually eaten some of it, its own practice what it preached. Let me say it that way. Caitlin, great to see you again. Thank you, Dave, great to be on. And Steve Lewitt, good to see you again. Senior Vice President and Director of Data Management at Associated Bank, the largest uh, bank in uh, Wisconsin. Thanks for coming on. Thanks, Dave. Nice to be here. All right, guys. So you heard my little narrative introduction. You're each at different stages of maturity uh, with, in terms of operationalizing your data, getting the most insight out of it. As I often say, data is plentiful, insights aren't. But getting insight in real time is critical uh, in this decade. So I'm going to ask you know, each of you to give us a sense as to where you are on that, that, that data journey or Victoria, in your case, because you're brand new to Northwestern Mutual, but you have a lot of deep expertise in, in healthcare and manufacturing, financial services, but kind of where you see just the general industry climate. Um, and, and we'll talk about the, the journeys that you are on, both personally and, and professionally. So Victoria, kick us off here. Sure, I think right now where I see the industry going is needing to have speed to insight, right? So. As I had experienced going through many organizations, we're all facing the same challenges today. And a lot of those challenges are, where, do my, where does my data live? Is my data trusted? Meaning has it been curated? Has it been cleansed? Is it qualified? Um, has it been classified? A lot of that is questions, right? What we see often happen is businesses, right? They know their KPIs. They know their business metrics. But they can't find where that data lives in their backend asset. Um, there's redundant data, disparate data all over the place where data is replicated because it's not well managed. So a lot of what governance and the platform of tools that governance the suite, right, offer back to organizations today is just that piece of it. I can tell you where your data is. I can tell you what's trusted. That way you can quickly access the information and bring back answers to business questions. That is one answer, not many answers, leaving the business to question what's the right path, right? Which is the correct answer? Which which way do I go at the executive level? That's the biggest challenge where we want uh, the industry to go moving forward, right? Is one, breaking that down, allowing that information to be published quickly and two, enabling data virtualization. A lot of what you see today is uh, most businesses, right? It takes time to build out large warehouses at an enterprise level. Um, we need to pivot quicker. So a lot of what businesses are doing is we're leaning them towards taking advantage of data virtualization, allowing them to connect to these data sources, right? To bring that information back quickly so they don't have to replicate that information across different systems or different uh, applications, right? And then to be able to provide that those answers back quickly, also allowing for seamless access too from the analysts that are running, um, running full speed, right? To try and find the answers as quickly as they can. 
Great. Okay, and, and I want to get into the sort of how to do this, but uh, Steve, let me go to you. Uh, one of the things that we talked about earlier was just infusing this this mindset of a of a of a data culture um, and thinking about data a, as a service. So, talk a little bit about sort of how you got started. You know, what, what was the starting? Um, take us through that. Sure. I think the the biggest thing for us there is to change that mindset from data being just for reporting for things that have happened in the past to do some insights on some some data that already existed. What we've tried to shift the mentality there is um, th to start to use data and fuse that into our actual applications so that we're providing those insights in real time to the applications as they're consumed, helping with customer experience, helping with our um, personalization and, and optimization of our application. The way we've started down that path or kind of the journey that we're still on was to get the foundation laid first. So part of that has been making sure we have access to all of that data, whether it's through virtualization like Vic talked about, or whether it's through having more of the, uh, the data collected in a data lake concept where we have all of that foundational data available as opposed to waiting for people to ask for it. That's been the biggest culture shift for us is having that availability of data to be ready to be able to provide those insights as opposed to having to make the businesses or the application owners ask for that data. Okay, Lynn, uh, when I first met Indipal Bandari, the IBM uh, Global Chief Data Officer, you know, I was asking him, okay, where does a, what, what's the role of that, that CDO? And, and, and he mentioned a number of things, but two of the things that stood out is, you got to understand how data affects the monetization of your company. That doesn't mean you know, selling the data. It's what role does it play in helping cut cost or, or revenue or productivity or, you know, customer service, et cetera. The other thing he said was you've got to align with the lines of business. Well, those sounded good. And this is several years ago. And IBM took it upon itself, uh, uh, drink its own champagne. I was going to say, you know, dog fooding, whatever. But it, it, it's not easy. It, it, you just flip a switch and uh, infuse AI and, and automate the data pipeline. You guys had to go, you know, some real uh, pain to get there. And you did, you, you were early on, you took some arrows, and now you're helping your customers better understand that. But talk about some of the use cases that, that where you guys have applied this, you're obviously the biggest organization, you know, one of the biggest in the world. The real challenge is there. Sure, um, happy to, Dave. Uh, you know, we've been on this journey for about four years now. So we stood up our first Global Chief Data Office uh, 2016. And you're right, it was all about getting that data strategy authored and executed internally. Um, and we want to be very transparent about it because as you mentioned, you know, a lot of challenges pops think differently about the value of data. Um, and so as we wrote that data strategy, it was at that time about becoming a cognitive enterprise. And then we quickly have pivoted to see the real opportunity and value of infusing AI across all of our major workflows. Um, to your question on uh, a couple of specific use cases, I'd say, you know, we invested that time getting that platform built and implemented and then we were able to take advantage of that. Uh, one particular example that I've been really um, excited about, I have a, a practitioner on my team who's a supply chain expert. And a couple of years ago, he started building out a supply chain solution so that we could better mitigate our risk in the event of a natural disaster like an earthquake or a hurricane um, anywhere around the world. And because we invested the time in getting the data pipelines right, and getting that um, all of that work curated and cleaned and the quality of it, we were able to um, recently, in, in recent uh, weeks, add the really critical COVID-19 data and deliver that out to our employees internally for their uh, preparation purposes, make that available to our nonprofit partners. And now we're starting to see our first customers uh, take advantage to, uh, with the health and well-being of their employees in mind. So that's, you know, an example, I think, where, and I'm seeing a lot of, you know, my clients I work with, they invest in the data and AI readiness, and then they're able to take advantage of all of that work work uh, very quickly in an agile fashion uh, to, to spin up those applications. Well, I think one of the keys there too, Caitlin, is that, you know, we, we could talk about that in a COVID-19 context, but it's that's going to carry through. That that notion of, of business resiliency, it's, it's going to live on, you know, in this post-COVID world, isn't it? Absolutely. I think for all of us, um, the importance of investing in the business continuity and resiliency uh, type work so that we know what to do in the event of either a natural disaster or something um, beyond, uh, you know, it'll be grounded in that 
and I think it'll only become more important um, for us to be able to act quickly. And so the investment in those platforms and approach that, that we're taking and, and, you know, I see many of us taking um, will really be grounded in that resiliency moving forward. So Vic and Steve, I want to dig into this a little bit uh, because, you know, we use this concept of data op, which we're stealing from DevOps. And, and there are similarities, but there are also differences. So let's talk about the data pipeline. If you think about the data pipeline as a sort of quasi linear process where you're ingesting data and you might be using you know, tools, whether it's Kafka or whatever favorite tool you have, and then you're transforming that, that, that data. And then you got to you know, discover, you got to do some, some exploration. You got to figure out your metadata catalog. And then you're trying to analyze that data to get some insights. And then you ultimately you want to operationalize it. Um, so, you know, and, and you could come up with your, your own data pipeline, but generally that sort of concept is, is I think well accepted. But there's different roles. And unlike DevOps, where it might be the same developer who's actually implementing security policies and taking it to operations, in, in, in data ops, there might be different roles. In fact, very often are. There's data science, there's maybe an IT role, there's data engineering, there's analysts, et cetera. So Vic, I wonder if you could, you could talk about uh, the challenges in, in managing and, and automating that data pipeline, applying data ops and, and how practitioners can overcome them. Yeah, I would say a perfect example would be a client that I was just recently working for um, where we actually took a team and we built up a team using agile methodologies, that framework, right? For rapidly ingesting data and then proving out data is fit for purpose, right? So um, often now we talk a lot about big data and that is really where a lot of industries are going. They're trying to add enrichment to their own data sources. So what they're doing is they're purchasing these third party data sets. So in doing so, right, you, you make that initial purchase, but what many companies are doing today is they have no real way to vet that. So they'll purchase the information. They aren't going to vet it up front. They're going to bring it into an environment. Um, they're, it's going to take them time to understand if the data is of quality or not. And by the time they do, typically the sales gone and done and they're not going to ask for anything back. What we were able to do at um, the most recent client was use an unstructured data source, right? Uh, bring that in, ingest that with modelers, uh, using this agile team, right? And within two weeks, we were able to bring the data in from the third party vendor, uh, what we considered rapid prototyping, right? Be able to profile the data, understand if the data is of quality or not, and then quickly figure out that, you know what, the data is not. So in doing so, we were able to then contact the vendor back, tell them, you know what, sorry, the data's not up to snuff. Uh, we'd like our money back, we're not gonna go forward with it. That's enabling businesses to be smarter with what they're doing with their data purchases today. Because many businesses right now, um, as much as they wanna rely on their own data, right, they actually wanna rely on trusted data from third party sources. And that's really what data ops is allowing us to do. It's allowing us to think at a broader, a higher level, right? What can we do to bring the information in what structures can we store them in that they don't necessarily have to be modeled because a modeler is great, right? But if we have to take time to model all the information before we even know we want to use it, that's going to slow the process down and that's slowing the business down. The business is looking for us to speed up all of our processes. A lot of what we heard in the past, right, is that IT tends to slow us down and that's where we're trying to change uh, that perception in the industry is no, we're actually here to speed you up. We have all the tools and technologies to do so. Um, and they're only getting better. I would say also um, data scientists, right? That's another piece of the pie for us. If we can bring the information in, we, we can quickly uh, catalog it in a metadata environment to bring in the information in the back backend um, data, data assets, right? And then supply that information back to scientists. Gone are the days where scientists are going and asking for connections to all these different data sources waiting days for access requests to be approved, uh, just to find out that once they figure out how, what the, the relationship diagram, right, the design looks like in that backend database, how to get to it, write the code to get to it, and then figure out that this is not the information I need, that Sally next to me, right, pulled me the wrong information, that's where the catalog comes in. That's where data ops and data governance, having that catalog, that metadata management platform available to you, they can go into a catalog without having to request access to anything quickly. And within five minutes, they can see the structures. What do the tables look like? What do the fields look like? Are these the, are these the metrics I need to bring back answers to the business? That's data ops. It's allowing us to speed up all of that information, You know, taking stuff that took 
months, now down to weeks, down to days, down to hours. So Steve, I wonder if you could pick up on that and just help us understand what data op means to you. Uh, we talked about earlier in our previous conversation, I mentioned it up front, is this notion of you know, the demand for, for data access is, it was through the roof and, and, and you, you've gone from that to sort of more of a self-service environment where it's not IT owning the data, it's really the businesses owning the data. But what, what, is, what does all this data op stuff mean in, in your world? Sure, I think it's very similar. It's it's how do we enable and get access to that quicker, showing the right controls, showing the right processes, and and building that scalability and agility into into all of it, so that we're 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 doing this at scale. It's much more um, rapidly available. We can discover new data sets quickly, determine if it's right or or more importantly if it's wrong. Um, similar to what what Vic described, it's it's how do we enable the business to make those right decisions on whether or not they're going down the right path, whether they're not. The catalog is a big part of that. Um, we've also introduced a lot of frameworks around scale. So um, just the ability to rapidly ingest data and make that available has been a key for us. We've also focused on a prototyping environment. So that sandbox mentality of how do we rapidly stand those up for users um, and, and still provide some controls, but a, a provide that ability for people to do that, that exploration. What we're finding is that by providing the platform and, and the um, foundational layers that we're, we're getting the use cases to sort of evolve and come out of that, as opposed to having the use cases prior to then go build things from. We're, we're shifting the mentality within the organization to say, we don't know what we need yet. Let's, let's start to explore. Uh, that's kind of that data scientist mentality and culture. It's more of a, a way of thinking as opposed to um, you know, an actual project or implementation. Well, I think that that cultural aspect is important. Of course, Caitlin, you guys are an AI company, or at least that's you know, part of what you do. Uh, but you know, you you for for decades, maybe century, you've been organized around different things. It might have been a factoring plant or sales channel or whatever it is. But 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 how has the chief data officer organization within IBM been able to transform itself and 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 really infuse a data culture across uh, the entire company? One of the approaches you know we've taken and we talk about sort of the blueprint to drive AI transformation so that we can achieve and deliver these really high value use cases. Um, we talk about the data and the technology, which we've just touched on, but the organizational piece of it and consideration are, are so important. The change management, enabling and equipping our data stewards. I'll give one uh, specific example that I've been really excited about. Um, when we were building our platform and starting to pull disparate data, structured, unstructured, um, pull it in, our data stewards were spending a lot of time manually tagging and creating business metadata about that data. And we, we identified that that was a real pain point, costing us a lot of money, valuable resources. So we started to automate the, the metadata um, and doing that in partnership with our deep learning practitioners and some of the models that they were able to build. Um, that uh, capability we pushed out into our Cloud Pack for Data, into our product last year. Um, and one of the, the, the really exciting things for me to see is our data stewards who we so value with the, the expertise and the skills that they bring um, have reported that you know, it's really changed the way they're able to work. Um, it's really sped up their process. It's enabled them to then move on to higher value capabilities and 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 business benefits. Um, and so they're you know, very happy from an organizational you know uh, configuration point of view. So I think there's ways to identify those use cases. Um, in our particular case, you know, we drove some significant productivity savings. We also really empowered and enabled our data stewards who we really value um, to make their job you know, easier, more efficient, um, and, and, and help them uh, move on to things that they are more you know, excited about doing. So I think that's a, you know, another example of, of uh, the approach we've been taking. Yeah, so the, the cultural piece, the people piece is key. We talked a little bit about the process. I want to get into a little bit into the tech. Steve, I wonder if you could tell us, you know, what's, what's the tech? We have this bevy of, of tools. I mentioned a number of them up front. You've got different data stores. Uh, you've got open source tooling. Uh, you've got IBM tooling. What are the critical components of the technology that people should be thinking about tapping in architect? Sure, from an ingestion perspective, we're trying to do a lot of kind of Python frameworks and, and scalable ingestion type frameworks. Um, on, on the catalog side, I think what we've done is gone with IBM Cloud Pack, uh, which provides a 
a platform for a lot of these tools to stay integrated together. So things from the discovery of data sources, the cataloging, um, the documentation of those data sources, and then all the way through the actual advanced analytics and Python models and our, our models and the open source side. Um, combined with the ability to do some data prep and refinery work. Uh, having that all in an integrated platform was a key to us for us to, to roll out kind of more of these tools in bulk as opposed to having the point solutions. Um, so that's been a, a big focus area for us. Uh, and then on the the analytics side and the, the web services side, there, there's a lot of different components you can go into, whether it's MuleSoft, whether it's AWS and some of the native functionalities out there. Um, you mentioned before Kafka and Kinesis streams and, and different streaming technologies. Those are all the ones that are kind of in our toolbox that we're, we're starting to look at. So, and one of the keys here is we're trying to make decisions in as close to real time as possible, uh, as opposed to the business having to wait, you know, weeks or months. And then by the time they get the insights, it's too late and really rear view mirror. So Vic, your focus, you know, in your career has been a lot on data, data quality, governance, master data you know, management, data uh, from a data quality standpoint as well. What are some of the key tools that, that you're familiar with that you've used that uh, really have enabled you to operationalize the data pipeline? You know, I would say um, definitely the IBM tools. I have the most experience with that. Also Informatica though as well. Those are to me the two top players. Um, IBM definitely has come to the table with a sweet Right, like Steve said, CloudPack for data is really a one-stop shop. So that's allowing that quick seamless access for a business user versus them having to go into some of the previous versions that IBM had rolled out where you're going into different user interfaces, right, to find your information and that can become clunky, it can add to process. Um, it can also create uh, almost like a bad taste in, a, in most people's mouths because they don't want to navigate from system to system to system just to get their information. So CloudPack to me, uh, definitely brings everything to the table in one in a one-stop shop type of environment. Informatica also though is working on the same thing. And I would tell you that they haven't come up with a solution that really comes close to what IBM's done with CloudPack for data. I'd be interested to see if they can bring that on the horizon, but really IBM's suite of tools allows for profiling, quality analytics, right? Uh, metadata management, um, Access to DBT Warehouse on Cloud, those are the tools that I've uh, worked in my past to implement, as well as Cloud Object Store to bring all that together to provide that one-stop shop. Um, at Northwestern, right, we're working right now with Calibra. I think Calibra is a great set of tool, or a great a governance catalog, right? But that's really what it's truly made for, is it's a governance catalog. You have to bring some other pieces to the table in order for it to serve up all that CloudPack does today, which is the advanced profiling, the data virtualization that CloudPack enables today, um, the machine learning at the level where you can actually work with R and Python code and Jupyter Notebooks inside of CloudPack. That's some of this, the pieces, right, that are missing in some of the under, other vendor schools today. Well, so one of the things that you're hearing here is the theme of, of, of openness. Uh, there's, there's, we've talked about a lot of tools that are not IBM tools, uh, all IBM tools, there, there are many, but, but people want to use what they want to use. So Caitlin, from an IBM perspective, what's your commitment to openness, number one, but also two, you know, we talked a lot about cloud packs, but to simplify the experience uh, for your client. Well, and I have to thank uh, Steve and Victoria for you know, speaking to their experience. I, I really appreciate the feedback. And part of our approach has been to really um, take one, the, the, the challenges that we've had. I mentioned some of the capabilities that we brought forward and, our cloud pack for data product, one being you know, automating metadata generation. And that was something we had to solve for our own data uh, challenges and needs. So we will continue to source you know, our use cases from um, and grounded from a practitioner perspective of what we're trying to do and solve and build. And the approach we've really uh, been taking is a co-creation one in that we roll these capabilities out into product, we work with our customers, um, like Steven, like Victoria, to really solicit feedback to product, route that back to our dev teams, push that out, and just be very open and transparent. I mean, we want to deliver a seamless experience. We want to do it in partnership and, and, and continue to solicit feedback and improve and roll out. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think that will uh, that has been our approach and will continue to be and really appreciate the partnerships um, that we've been able to foster. So we don't have a ton of time, but I want to go to the, the two practitioners on the, the panel and ask you about key, key performance indicators. When I think about DevOps, 
One of the things that we're measuring is the elapsed time to deploy applications start to finish. We're, we're measuring the amount of rework that has to be done, the, the quality of the, the deliverable. What are the KPIs, Victoria, that are indicators of success in uh, uh, operationalizing uh, da the data pipeline? Well, I would definitely say your ability to deliver quickly, right? So how fast can you deliver? Is that is that quicker than what you've been able to do in the past, right? What is the user experience like, right? So have you been able to measure what, what the amount of time was, right, that users were spending to bring information to the table in the past versus have you been able to reduce that time to delivery, right, of information, business answers to business questions? Those are the, the key performance indicators to me that tell you that the suite that we've put in place today, right, it's providing information quickly. I can get my business answers quickly, but quicker than I could before. And the information is accurate. So being able to measure, is it quality that I've been giving, that I've given back, or is this not? Is it the wrong information? And yet I've got to go back to the table and find uh, where I need to gather that from, from somewhere else. That to me tells us, okay, you know what, the tools we've put in place today, my teams are working quicker, they're answering the questions that they need to accurately, that is when we know we're on the right path. Steve, anything you'd add to that? I think she covered it, a lot of the key po components the, around the data quality scoring, right, for all the different data attributes, coming up with a, a metric around how to measure that, um, and, and then showing that trend over time to show that it's, it's getting better. The other one that we're doing is just around overall data availability. How, how much data are we providing to our users and, and let, showing that trend. So when, when I first started, you know, we had um, somewhere in the neighborhood of, of 500 files that, that have been brought into the warehouse and, and had been published and available um, in the neighborhood of a couple thousand fields. We've grown that into we have we have thousands of tables now available, so it's it's been you know, hundreds of percent in scale as far as just the availability of that data, how much is out there, how much is is ready and available for for people to just dig in and put into their their analytics and their models and get those back into the other applications. So that that's another key key metric that we're starting to track as well. So last yeah, question. So I I said at the top that every application is going to need to be infused with AI this decade. Otherwise, that, that application not going to be as competitive as it should be. Uh, and so for those that are maybe stuck in their journey, don't really know where to get started. Uh, I'll start with, with Caitlin and then go to Victoria and then, and then Steve to bring us home. What advice would you give to people that need to get going on this? Uh, my, my advice is I, I think if you pull the the folks that are either producing or accessing your data and figure out what the greatest pain is. I mentioned uh, some of the data management uh, challenges we were seeing. This, these processes were taking weeks um, and prone to error, highly manual. So that was ripe for uh, AI projects. So identifying those use cases, I think, um, that are really causing you know, the most pre-work and, and manual effort, um, you can move really quickly. And as you build this platform out, you're able to spin those up um, in an accelerated uh, fashion. I think uh, identifying that, that and, and figuring out the business impact you're able to drive very early on, um, you can get those going and start really seeing the, the value. Great. Vic? Yeah, I would actually say, Caitlin hit it on the head, but I would probably add to that, right, is the first and foremost, uh, in my opinion, right, the importance around this is data governance. Uh, you need to implement a data governance at an enterprise level. Many um, organizations will do it but they'll have silos of governance. You really need an enterprise uh, data governance platform that consists of a true framework of an operational model, model charters, right? You have data domain owners, data domain stewards, data custodians, all that needs to be defined. And while that may take some work in, in the beginning, right? The payoff down the line is that much more. It's, it, it's allowing your business to truly own the data. Once they own the data and they take part in classifying the data assets, uh, for technologists and for analysts, right, you can start to eliminate some of the technical debt that most organizations have acquired today. They can start to look at what are some of the systems that we can turn off? What are some of the systems that we see of value and truly build out a capability matrix where we can start mapping systems, right, to capabilities and start to say, where do we have, where is the redundancy, right? What can we get rid of? That's the first piece of it. And then the second piece of it is really leveraging 
the tools that are out there today, the IBM tools, some of the other tools out there as well that enable um, some of the newer next generation capabilities like data in, a, in AI, right, for example, allowing automation for automation, um, which right for all of us means that a lot of the analysts that are in place today, they can access the information quicker, they can deliver the information accurately like we've been talking about because it's been classified, that pre-work's been done. It's never too late to start, but once you start that, it just really acts as a domino effect to everything else where you start to see everything else fall into place. All right, thank you. And Steve, bring, bring us home. Advice for your, for your peers that want to get started. Sure, I think the key for me too is yeah, like, like those guys have, have talked about, I think all everything they said is valid and accurate. The thing I would add is, is from a starting perspective, if you haven't started, start, right? Don't, don't try to overthink it, over plan it, just get started, just do something um, and, and, and start to show that progress and value. The use cases will come, even if you think you're not there yet. Um, it, it's amazing once you have the foundational components there, how, how some of these things start to kind of come out of the woodwork. So, so, Get started, get going, make have it have that iterative approach to this, and, and an open mindset. Ex encourage exploration and enablement. Um, look your organization in the eye to say, why are there silos? Why do these things exist? What are our problems? What are the things getting in our way? And and focus and tackle those those areas, um, as opposed to trying to put up more rails and more boundaries and and kind of encourage that siloed mentality. Um, really, really look at how do you how do you focus on that enablement. And then the last comment would just be on scale. Um, everything should be focused on scale. What you think is a one-time process today, you're going to do it again. We've all been there. You're, you're going to do it a, a, a thousand times again. So prepare for that. Prepare for ever, that you're going to do everything a thousand times um, and, and start to instill that culture within your organization. A great advice, guys. Uh, data, bringing machine intelligence and AI to really drive insights and scaling with a cloud operating model, no matter where that data lives. It's really great to have, have three such knowledgeable practitioners, Caitlin, Victoria, and Steve, thanks so much for coming on theCUBE and helping support this panel. Thank, thank you. you, thank you very much. All right, and thank you for watching everybody. Now, remember this panel was part of the raw material that went into a crowd chat that we uh, hosted on uh, May 27th, crowdchat.net slash data ops. So go check that out. This is Dave Vellante for theCUBE. Thanks for watching.